Well, welcome you back to session number nine in our series on expository preaching. This session marks a major transition in our course. Uh, this is the beginning of our third major section. Our first section was designed to create a value and an understanding of expository preaching. The second session, the last four meetings we have had have been on exegesis and exposition of the epistles. And with this session and for the next four sessions, we want to walk through another major genre of our Bible, and that is narrative. Narrative, in fact, is the predominant genre of the Bible, covering many of our Old Testament books as well as the Gospels. And so as we begin this study, I want to remember and remind you of two key things. We want to remember our key commitments, our hermeneutics. One, that this is the Word of God and that we are concerned about authorial intent, that what the human author and what God meant to communicate to the original audience is important to us. That's the primary meaning of the text. And that these men wrote with pastoral uh, hearts, with pastoral emphasis, because they wanted people to understand. And so they didn't hide meanings. They didn't write in a bunch of code. They tried to be as clear as possible as a pastor would be. And the fourth hermeneutical principle we talked about was genre, that there were different styles of writing with different rules for interpretation, different tools. And as we switch from epistles, that the tools were really grammar and how thoughts were put together by words and clauses and paragraphs. We're transitioning and our tools here will be different. But we want to remember that those hermeneutical commitments are always the same that we always want to try to find uh, the original, the, the main meaning of a text and be able to explain and present that as well as the structure of the passage to our audience. So as I said, the tools will no longer be grammar. And so if nothing else has been accomplished in this course, at least you have finished the grammar section of it. As we work with narrative, we will introduce three new tools. It won't be paragraphs and clauses and key words. It will be setting and characters and plot structure. The way we'll walk through that over these next four sessions together is during this session, I will introduce narrative. I'll give you some information about narrative literature and we'll talk about setting. The next session, we will talk about characters and characterization. And then in our final two sessions, we will introduce plot structure. We'll illustrate it briefly with the Magi in Matthew 2, and then we'll come back for a final session where we will look at Zacharias and Elizabeth in Luke 2, and we will analyze them as characters presented by Luke, as well as the structure of the plot of that story. So I'm excited about this study, and I hope it will be beneficial to all of us as we spend time in the narrative sections of Scripture. So let me begin by just sharing some basic information about narrative. Remember, in the epistles, our goal was to find the meaning and flow of a passage. We looked for the flow of a passage by evaluating words and grammar. The tool we used to evaluate words and grammar was the structured layout. Hopefully by now we've seen that a structured layout is a powerful tool to help us understand what the epistle writers are writing. But an epistle engages our mind. And an epistle is written with statements and supporting information. Narratives are different. Narrative engages our heart. We're able to imagine the details which allow us to engage the narrative differently than we do with simple facts that we find in an epistle. We can identify and empathize with characters. We become invested in the outcome of the story. We get caught up in the plot. This is why we love story. Because of this, one of the great benefits of narrative is that it holds our attention and can be very memorable and impacting. However, one of the great dangers of narrative to us as exegetes working with a passage is that unlike epistles, which communicate meaning directly, Narrative communicates meaning indirectly. Narrative communicates meaning through thoughts and words of a character, through the structure of a story, what's brought in, what's left out, through emphasis. It's left up to us as exegetes to truly know how best to understand and interpret and apply some of those indirect elements in a story. 
So let me say just a word about the four major elements in biblical narrative. I've already mentioned a couple to you. But the first is setting, that every story is set in some context. One of the great things about Hebrew literature is Hebrew writers never add any additional detail. If there is something said about the setting, if there's a mention of the length of a day or the size of a city or the distance of a travel, it's there for an important purpose. And so we need to pay attention as exegetes to the way setting is set up. Second is plot structure. And the plot structure is the way a story begins from beginning to end. And we'll introduce the elements of a plot structure. Plot is a powerful tool that authors use to communicate meaning. Third is characters and characterization. As we talk about characters in the next session, we'll talk about the way authors directly and indirectly develop characters, their thoughts, their words, their behaviors. We're, we will also talk about how characters are used to contrast one another. A fourth major element is rhetorical features. There are elements like the pace of a narrative. And so in the early chapters of the Gospels, Jesus moves from 12 years old to 30 very quickly. And a quarter of the Gospels are spent on the last week of Jesus's life. The pace of narrative tells us something about the significance of what these authors are trying to communicate. Other rhetorical features would include repetition, the role of the author, and in word plays. So let's talk a little bit about setting. The setting is where and when the characters enact the plot. And as I said, biblical narrative is very efficient. There's no extra data that's given. And so if something is stated, if we hear about Absalom's hair, Saul's height, that is there because the author is communicating something significant. If the author elaborates, it is for a literary purpose. So let's talk a little bit about the types of setting. There are four types of narrative settings that you'll find. The first is physical geographical location. The physical geographical location provides a background and atmosphere and information for the story. You want to pay attention when a story changes in physical or geographical locations. In later sessions, when we're looking at Zacharias and Elizabeth, you will see that they start in their hometown and they move to Jerusalem. And then they're in the, the temple court outside Jerusalem. And then Zacharias goes in the temple and then he comes back out. And as each change in location occurs, the plot is moved along. We'll want to pay attention to that. An example you may turn to now is in 2 Samuel 2. This story is the story of Abner gathering Ishbosheth and anointing him as king in opposition to David. David is in Hebron. You can think of Hebron as the capital city of whatever state or whatever country you are in right now. That David is in the epicenter. David is where all the decisions are made. Unlike David, Abner gathers Ishbosheth and his men and takes them to Mahanaim. If you were to get a map out and look at Hebron and Mahanaim, Mahanaim is as far east as you could possibly go. It was far, it was small, it was hidden. And this location tells us something about what Abner thinks about what he's doing and what he thinks about his uh, potential to overthrow David with Ishbosheth. It's also interesting to do a study on Mahanaim, and you'll see that is the place where Jacob wrestled with God in Genesis 32. It's the place of entering promise. And it's now a place of rebellion. And so we see both the physical location and theological significance in that location. Another place where physical location plays an important role is in Jonah chapter 3, verses 3 and 4. There have been many commentators who have said that Jonah was in rebellion in Jonah 1, that he repents in Jonah 2. In Jonah 3, he now carries out the mission he was supposed to do in Jonah 1. And, and his, he is successful in Jonah 4. But Jonah 3, 3 and 4 suggests something different. You see, God tells Jonah that Nineveh is going to be destroyed in 40 days. And then Jonah 3, 3 and 4 talk about the city of Nineveh. The author of Jonah could have just written it was a big city. He could have said it was a great city if he wanted to say it was great. 
But the author says it was an exceedingly great city, a three days walk. Why would he say a three days walk? Remember, Hebrew writers don't put in extra details. And so it's in there for a reason. If Jonah has 40 days to warn the city and the city takes three days to walk around it, Jonah should have walked around the city 13 times for 39 days. That would have left him plenty of time to leave if the city was to be destroyed. The next verse says that Jonah walked a one day's journey. Jonah is not seeking repentance. Jonah never even made it through the city. In fact, his message is not the message God told him to bring. God gave him a new message in Jonah 3, but Jonah delivers the Jonah 1 message. Jonah is doing enough not to get thrown back into the fish, but Jonah's heart is not for the people. And the way that uh, Jonah, as he's writing the book, describes the city reveals that. Uh, a third example of physical location would be in Joshua 3.15. The tribes in Joshua 3.15 have come to the Jordan and they're crossing the Jordan. If you've ever traveled to Israel, there are places in the Jordan where it's no more than a stream. And Joshua wants to make sure we understand the miraculous nature of what's taking place in Joshua 3. And so he puts in a parenthetical statement, not because he was trying to increase his word count like a high school kid might do on a paper, but he did it because he wanted to make a theological statement. He said it was at the time of year when Jordan, the Jordan River was overflowing its banks during the harvest. He wants the reader to know that God did something miraculous there. And so whether it's Samuel or Jonah or Joshua, those are just examples of how physical location plays an important role in understanding the setting of a story. The second category of setting is historical setting. This is the time frame in history when the story occurred. The first few verses of Exodus give us a background to that book historically. It brings us up to date from the time of Joseph to where we are when the story in Exodus starts. It talks about a Pharaoh arising who does not know Joseph. We're told that Ruth occurs during the time of Judges in Ruth 1.1. Ezra and Daniel give us historical settings that help us understand what is being said in the book because we can know more about the historical setting they occur in. The third type of setting to pay attention to is the cultural setting. Sometimes it can be helpful to know the customs of the ancient Near East. Otherwise, we can misunderstand things. An example of this is the marriage feast in the Gospels. If you remember the story, there are 10 bridesmaids and the bridegroom is coming, but the bridesmaids don't know when and they need to be prepared. And five are prepared and five are not. And the lesson is that we don't know when Christ is coming. So we should live every day as if today might be that day. I, I was in a North African country a while back and I got a better understanding on this passage. I had always read that passage about marriage it, with a Western concept where the wedding is all about the bride. But while I was in that North African country, we were asleep one night and we were awakened to the sound of beating drums. I remember wondering what is happening. And it wasn't until the next day I found out that it was a bridegroom because the bridegroom picks the time when he will go get the bride. And this bridegroom had picked 2 a.m. I would hate to think of the life that wife may have now if he picks 2 a.m. to go get her. But he had picked 2 a.m. that night. And we heard the wedding processional of, of men walking with the bridegroom as he was going to get his wife and to surprise her. And that's the background for the marriage feast. And understanding that cultural background is helpful. Understanding about Elijah and Baal and the fertility customs in the ancient Near East helps us understand the issue of drought as we study those stories. Other stories, whether it's washing feet, the treating of a Samaritan or funeral practices can be helpful. There are plenty of resources on the internet that can help you understand and gain information about cultural background. We read the story of the woman washing Jesus's feet and in a Western culture, that's not as sh shocking as it's meant to be. Uh, in Jesus's day, a woman would not have been in the room and a woman most definitely would never touch a man who was not her husband. The idea of her touching his feet 
and wiping them with her hair would be a very seductive and incredibly inappropriate thing for any man to do, especially a teacher. And understanding that cultural setting can help understand the shock that was felt in the room and heighten the point that Jesus is making. The fourth type of setting that we need to be aware of is the theological redemptive or canonical setting that we always must read in light of where this story connects to God's overall redemptive plan. There are other courses that Access Truth puts out that talks about the meta narrative of God. And as we talk about individual episodes or individual stories of narrative, it's important to remember that every story fits into the larger story. In our last session, we will spend the last few minutes showing how even the gospel stories that we talk about will fit into the story of the gospels and how the gospels fit into the story of the Bible. And we need to understand as we interpret our story that it plays a role in God's overall plan. An example might be the selecting of Abraham and how that selection fits within the broader theological themes of what God is doing to select a people out to always have a representative on earth. An example of this type of setting would be Abraham and his selection by God and how that fits into broader theological themes of God always having a people, a representative people on earth and what he's doing to cultivate and subdue the earth. We just have a few moments left in this session. What I'd like to do is list maybe a few questions or things to be aware of as you are looking at narrative regarding setting. Always pay attention to the names that are mentioned in a story. Especially in the Old Testament, it's important to know the meaning of the names that are mentioned. In the book of Ruth, the names of uh, the different characters all say something about them. Each of the prophets, their name plays into the message of their book. And so you'll want to know what those prophets names mean. If a location is mentioned in a story, you'll want to know where is it located? Pull out a map, take time to understand what's being discussed. Do you know what the land is like there? Is it flat? Is it hilly? What was it like in Samaria or what was it like to walk around? or to be with David in, in the south of Israel. Where else do these locations get mentioned in the Bible? As we said earlier about Mahanaim, that it comes up in the life of David, but it was also a place that was where Jacob wrestled with God. It's important to know those things. What are some things you might expect to hear about setting, but you don't? What time period does the story occur? Are there settings or actions that you may not fully understand? Can you access internet resources or dictionaries to find this out? What customs are being displayed in the story that the original audience would have known, but your audience won't? Internet resources are a great help for that. Setting is the first of the three tools we wanna to look at as we study narrative. It's probably the shortest and easiest to understand in some ways, it's the least impacting, but it's important for us always to know the time and place in which the events of the stories of the Bible take place. They will help you tell the story to your congregation and make application in ways that bring the story to life.